First of all, um, it's, it's really thankful for coming. And uh, I, I, I hadn't seen the theatre before I came on the stage. And it's really beautiful. Yes. Um, so it, it's, it's a real pleasure to be on this stage. Um, the, um, I, I haven't made a documentary for, for some years. And um, an archive documentary was particularly attractive. Um, because you don't have to shoot any film, you can just, mm -hmm. it just comes into the cutting room. Um, so you don't, the alarm doesn't go at 6 o'clock every morning to get out of bed. Um, you, you turn up at 9 o'clock and still make the film. Um, so it's particularly attractive to see your film there. Um, and it was a story I wanted to tell for a long time because after the, the war, um, there was a, a, a very strong feeling that um, there needed to be a new way of running society. Um, the experience of the 1920s and the 1930s was one of great poverty for the working class people. Um, huge unemployment, um, alienation, um, soup kitchens, people with not enough food to eat, um, slums, terrible housing. Um, and people said, we don't want to go back to that. And then during the war, uh, the, a lot of uh, the industries were taken into public ownership because the railways had been run by private companies and they'd been disastrous. So, the, the, the government said, in order to win, to fight the war, we have to have an efficient railway system. So they took it into public ownership. For the coal mines, they said, we need a supply of coal, so we must take it into public ownership. Um, obviously, the armed forces are, um, are centrally organized. They're not private armies. And so after the war, people said, well, we, we took things into public ownership to fight, why can't we take things into public ownership to organize the peace and to conquer unemployment, to conquer poverty, so that everyone can live equally and with some dignity. So they did. And we, we owned the water, the electricity, the gas, the railways, the coal mines, the steel industry, and finally the car industry. Um, and it was a high point of um, British politics. It wasn't, it had many faults. Um, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't controlled from the bottom. There was no industrial democracy. The railway workers weren't organizing the railways along with the engineers and the, uh, the, the, the passengers. It was run by a state bureaucrat from the top, same as the coal mine, same as everything else. So it, it wasn't, it was, it was flawed, it wasn't perfect. But nevertheless, the idea that we, we could work together in, for everyone's interest, and of course we established the health service, a huge jewel in, in our political history, where everybody had medical care free, and everybody contributed to it according to their means. And we had a great program of popular housing, so that people had good houses, well built, and not done through a private contractor. So it was the idea of the public good, and the power of working people to control their industries, was a, a real high point. So we just wanted to tell this story. And the way you've made the film is you've used the archive and then you've chosen witnesses um, who are um, not really experts or, um, or historians, except to the degree that they're maybe financial consultants or they're there. Um, um, well, how is it supposed to work? Because there's a generation of people that, that when, you, when, you, when we all say, well, Thatcherism did this and was the end of that and so on. Those, 
those people, and there's also an international audience who have similar bits of history. How, it does, how will this uh, uh, documentary work in bringing back these, uh, these memories? Because uh, I found it very powerful, but I was aware all the time of my age and how close I am relatively to that generation. Well, uh, it's, it's a part of our history that is, is written out of, um, it's, we, we don't talk about it now, because the consciousness now is about the individual, private companies, big corporations, an economy based on self-interest. Um, so the time when the economy was based on the collective interest has been written out of our history. Um, and as you say, we try to do it through the memories of ordinary people. So it, it's not um, academics talking, it's people who were there. There's, there's a, a miner who raised the flag of the nationalized industry above his pit as he was the youngest member. Uh, there's a doctor who, um, for the first time, was able to treat a sick child when the mother had no money to pay for the doctor. And he said, today, I can treat your child and you don't have to pay me. Um, there's a nurse who remembers the beginning of the health service and uh, she's there when, when it formally began. And her memory is that they, it, the day was so special, all the nurses got a cake as a memory. Um, <laughs> Let, let's show a little bit of the film, so because okay. there will be people here that haven't seen it. I thought it would be very nice to show Berlin um, something which is shocking in the way that now way that maybe you know the Pope being able to resign or something is shocking which is some people being quite rude to Winston Churchill. Can, can I say something yes, about it? Yes. Yes. This, this is um, it was my favourite bit of archive when we when we uh, were looking through all the hours of archive this was my favourite bit because Winston Churchill is seen since the since the 1940s has been sanctified. It's like he's a saint. But working people in Britain at that time, had a different memory of Winston Churchill. Winston Churchill was an imperialist. He spent the most of his life fighting the working class of his own country. He sent troops in to, uh, to deal with the strike of miners. So there was a lot of bitterness about Winston Churchill. Um, and of course he had his moment of glory. You know, the six years of the war were his moment of glory. But um, uh, I'm glad you've chosen this clip because um, it is, um, it's another way of seeing a man who was effectively a politician on behalf of the ruling class of his country, as well as um, being a wartime leader. And those who, no doubt, this audience knows the, 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 some of the landmarks of your, of your early career, particularly the the housing policy uh, debate that was sparked off from the film itself of Cathy Come Home. Um, I want to show, I want to jump forward and show the clip of Kess because it's the beginning of your international film career. Um, and I want to ask you, um, uh, when you are uh, thinking, um, I and mean, in this case you're adapting a book, but there is an area in which right now, as your team of three people in effect with Paul Laverty and Rebecca Bryan, um, you're saying, okay, where are we going next? What, what, what area are we going to head for? Um, uh, and then there's six months of research or something, um, which is all overlapping with the last film. Can you give a character to those kind of discussions? Right from the very beginning, working with you, working with Tony Garnett at that time, but there were different teams, of that discussion about, okay, what's the, what's the next film going to be? Where are we going to go now? Um, yes. Um, well, um, the, the, the biggest question, I think, in, in filmmaking, in, in our trade, is, is what film do you try and make? Um, what's the story? What, what is worth, what's the idea? What's the central idea? What is worth spending a year, two years of your life working on? Um, and is the central idea valid? Is, is, it worth, is, is it worth sharing the idea with the audience? Does it have any significance? Um, will it mean anything to people? Um, what, what's, what's the point? Um, and and that, that question, or those, those questions, are, are the biggest questions that we have to deal with. All the technical questions of how do we realize it, who should we cast, I mean, very important, but they come secondary. The biggest question is, what is the film? 
And um, that, I, I've always worked, as, as you say, with uh, a very good producer, and I've been lucky, I've had you know, two or three really brilliant producers, and four or five wonderful writers that I've worked with. Um, and together we've shared, uh, we've shared a, a view, uh, shared a way of looking at the world, um, shared a, an analysis of how society works, and the mechanisms within society. Um, and I think those are the questions that you have to hammer out. E even though the film you, you're doing is maybe a comedy, but nevertheless there are always implications in the characters you choose, the story you tell, the, the place that it has in the world, uh, the significance of it. They, they all relate back to a fundamental view of how the world is. And I, personally, I, I can't stress that too much. I can't imagine working on something with a writer where you don't, you don't share that view. Because it determines everything. It determines the whole essence of the project. Um, and so we... The, the, the key writers I worked with were, were Barry Hines, who, who wrote the book of, of Kesh. And Barry was essentially a novelist. Um, but had a wonderful way of capturing character and dialogue um, on the page. And when you read a page of his dialogue, it just lived. Um, and he, he, he's from a part of England called uh, South Yorkshire, which is a mining area. And it has a very particular dialect. Um, the, the, the old English, thee and thou, is still used. Um, was used even more when we, we made this film. And um, he, he captures the rhythm of that. And that, that to me is the essence of the writer, is not to be able to break a, a, um, a script into scenes and directions. That's the director's job, or can be the director's job. The essence, the importance of the writer is, is, the, is, is capturing characters and dialogue on the page that when you when you start to realise it on film, it absolutely lives, it really lives. And it gives the people who play it, the actors who play it, the, it gives them life immediately. Um, and I think that's always underestimated. So the the, the course in, in this case, uh, Tony Garnett, who was the producer, had read Barry Hines's first book and thought it was very good. And uh, Tony and I met Barry, um, and he, his next book was A Kestrel for an Ape. And Tony said he'd, that we should try and make a film, which was, I was very pleased with that. Um, and we went and met Barry, and he, he took us through the whole story of the film, around the place where he lived. He showed us the places. We went to his school where he was a teacher. Um, and uh, just got to know the location and the people. Um, and it's very close to the area I grew up in, so it was like, it was like going home for me. Um, and um, it had a very, it had a very uh, strong sense of the place and the people. Um, and then from the book, it was very simply a question for, of editing into a, a narrative, um, and, and reducing it to the essential narrative that you needed for the film, and losing the sections that were literary, or were um, in the characters' heads, um, and, and just paring it down. And it's the easy job. It's the job that a sub-editor does on a newspaper every day. It's not, you know, we shouldn't overvalue that job. That's, that's the creative part is putting it on the, paper, on the page. The creative job is starting with a blank sheet of paper and a pen and ink and writing. Um, the easy job is say, I'll cut that bit out, I'll go from that bit to that bit, that's easy. Um, so that, that's why I have huge respect for writers always and uh, feel that they are very undervalued in, in our business. Yes, you're in the cheap seats. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, um, it, 
it's a big question, really, uh, and everybody um, reaches the, a method of working um, by trial and error over the years. And um, and as you say, it, it's for for this. I mean, there are many kinds of films, but for this kind of film, it should seem spontaneous. It should seem as though it's just happened. You know, I mean, I, I, I think it's it's like a. When a, a great pianist plays uh, Chopin, you, it should be like he's just sat down at the piano and he's just played this extraordinary music. But of course it is written down. Um, but when you, when, you, when you hear the performance, it should be, it's just happened, it's just been created. Um, and that's the kind of feeling we, you, we try, I try to get in the films. Um, and I think it, there are, I mean, I, I, I realized the importance of it when I began in television and as, as Ben was saying, I did a police series. And in the series, you had to, there was a format and you cast it and you rehearsed for two weeks and then you did it like a stage play in an electronic studio. And I cast, we would cast it and we would have a read through and the actors were quite good. And then I would direct them for two weeks. And they were terrible. <laughs> and they were wooden, and it was all rehearsed, and it had no spontaneity. Um, and it was shocking. And, and uh, I realized how bad I was at doing it. Um, and so when we came to do films, um, we started doing a number of things. Um, 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 <laughs> um, but first of all, um, we abolished the read-through uh, completely, so nobody reads it through. And then um, we started to shoot in sequence, so that instead of, sh as often in films, you shoot the last bit first. We start at the beginning in the, the order the events would have happened, not necessarily in the order you cut them together, but the order the events would have happened. And started on the first day at the beginning and finish on the last day at the end. And the accountants complain about this and say, well, you have to keep going back to the same location. But I'd sooner have a simpler location and shoot in sequence than have a very expensive location and, and shoot the beginning, the, the, the end of the film at the beginning. Um, so it's a question of priorities, because that way, you take the actors through the story, and they can develop. And what we film today is then a rehearsal for what we're going to film tomorrow. And you don't have to, to talk a lot about the state of mind you'll be in when you do a particular scene, because you've done the preparation, which is the scene we've done yesterday. Or well, the scene we do today is a preparation for the scene we do tomorrow. So you don't have to intellectualize it, it's simply an emotional memory and it doesn't have to go through the brain because I think the best, the best um, uh, weapon you have, the, 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 the strongest element you have as a director is the actor's instinct and the actor can be detached from his instinct as I found out doing my bad rehearsals. The, the actor's instinct is the, most, is the strongest element you have. And the instinct it should, should just come without, without going through the brain and working it out, because then it's not instinctive. So, a person I rely on the, the actor's instinct, absolutely. Um, another... Um, Nowadays you give, you give pages the night before as well. Um, not exactly, it depends. But certainly not give the whole script out at the beginning. So that a, another key point is that you play each scene for the value of that scene, at that moment. You don't play it thinking I've got to get to, oh God, I, I, I can't respond full out here because I've got to save my tears till week five. <laughs> you can actually play each scene right for that time. So as, as you say, um, we've, we've developed a, a method of not giving the whole script at the beginning. So you, the, the, the important thing is that the, the performers have got to know everything about the past of the character, so you can't surprise them by something from their past. 
because that's not helpful. But you, for something they have no control over in the future, then if it's a surprise, then you have to shoot the surprise. You have to shoot the shock. Because e even the, the most talented actor will have trouble being shot twice. <laughs> because the, the timing of that is so instinctive that to reproduce it is, is almost impossible. I, I mean, I've worked with fantastic actors, brilliant actors, and they all, that's the hardest thing, is surprise. So if there's a surprise, you've got to shoot the surprise, which means you can't show the whole scene, the, the whole script, before you start. Um, I mean, central to the whole process is um, something I haven't talked about, which is casting. And, and that is, that's a long process. And it means, I think there are various things you can't, very difficult to act. It's very difficult, difficult to act a different social class from your own. Because upper class people have things that they just get accustomed to, that they do without thinking, that is absolutely, it's not instinctive, it's not born in, but it's, it's, it's learned from a very early age. Um, just a way of dealing with people, it, it's, it's, Absolutely, they've been rehearsing this all their lives. Same for working class people, same for middle class people. So it's very hard to transcend class. You can put on a different voice, but it's not, it's not true. So I, I think you have to cast within, you have to respect the class of the, the social class. Also the place. I mean, you couldn't get, it's very difficult to, to reproduce an accent or a dialect. You can do it phonetically, so it sounds okay, but it's the choice of words, it's the humour, it's the rhythm of speech, it's the attitudes that are contained within language. That, and you can do it phonetically, but absorbing that, um, those whole attitudes is, is, I think, difficult, if not impossible. So I'd always choose people from the place, and always choose people from the social class. And then finding the people who, when they reveal themselves, and this is critical, I think, when they reveal themselves, they reveal something about the, car, the character. So you want them to be vulnerable, and that's very brave, and you discover that in, you know, when you're improvising with people before you cast them. Find actors who are vulnerable and open, and put themselves in, you know, don't, don't have strong defences to defend themselves emotionally. So, so they're prepared to be open. And then take them through it, stage by stage. And sometimes, sometimes within the scenes you have to spring little surprises. So like in that scene, I would have just said to David, I mean David in the, in the film, in the story, plays the boy. He's, um, his, his, his brother is looking for him because he's, he's in trouble with his brother, so that's why he's anxious, he's got to hide. So he, I said, look, because you, your, your brother's looking for you, you've got to escape. So the timing of his getting up and down was down to him, and it was different each time. So, so that meant that Bernard, who was playing the adult, responded differently each time. So each time it had a different rhythm. So he had to think it each time. Um, and I think that's, that means that you never settle into such a dead pattern that you're simply repeating the same pattern over and over again. So I'm talking too much, but it's fine, it's fine. Yeah. I, I don't remember much of the politics of 45 from the time, because I was nine, so yeah. it didn't. Um, I remember the euphoria at the end of the war and people coming home, but I didn't remember the politics. The things that have inspired me, I'm sure, are what inspire everyone here. It's people who fight back. You know, it was, it's the working class of my own country that, have, uh, that fought across centuries, across decades. It's the people who struggle for Irish independence. It's uh, the miners who fought a great strike. It's the women who have uh, led led disputes, it, it's, it's, the, it's the working class on the move. That, that's what's inspirational. Whether it's in Spain in the Civil War, 
I say whether it's the Irish in the War of Independence, whether it's the Partisans during the Second World War, whether it's the Nicaraguans, whether it's the Chile in, in the Sandinista Revolution. And, and it's finding people, I mean, we went to Nicaragua and filmed there, and, and we met women and men who, would, uh, who still believed in the ideals of the, the Sandinista movement, even when the Sandinista leadership had, had, had left them, and even when the revolution was lost or was being lost, and still fought and still talked about their risk, and, and still believed uh, when their children were being shot or killed or tortured. Um, it's the people who have gone through it, really. Um, and you find them in every society at every time, and uh, they're always there. So, and th they're the ones who in inspire you. I mean, we went to Spain and made a film about the Spanish Civil War, and um, met a, a woman who was working in a market, and she fought um, with the uh, with the Marxist group, the PUM, in Spain, and she was she was working in the market, and uh, we talked to her and. Uh, she told us extraordinary stories of, of, um, of fighting the fascists and uh, to begin with she wouldn't talk, you know, and then finally she talked about fighting the fascists and, and, and she still blazed with anger when she remembered how the women were all back on the front line and they had to do the cooking instead of doing the fighting and she still was bitter about not being able to shoot fascists. So it's 60 years later, you know, and, and people like those are the ones, you, you walk away from, from that meeting and you think, you know, my God, we have to do justice to their struggle, <coughs> and they're, they're the people who inspire you, so and I'm sure they, I mean, everyone here will find the same inspiration, it's, it's not hard to find a few of them. I mean, I think um, an idea that's, um, that we, we've struggled with um, for a long time is, is the idea of, of leadership, of, of working class struggles. Um, and I think it's an issue that's um, bedeviled politics um, for the century. Um, because you always find people who resist. You find people who will resist uh, oppression, or um, injustice, or um, lo a lack of democracy, or whatever. People will resist. But then, and, and there's great militancy. The problem then is, is the leadership. Because the, the militancy and the strength can be led into a cul-de-sac, or it can, be, it can have a political perspective which gives it some chance of victory. And the problem that, that we've always had is that, um, to, for example, the miners' strike. The miners were hugely strong, had great political and industrial strength, but they had no support from other trade unions because the other trade unions didn't want the miners to win. So it was, it was always a question of leadership. In the Spanish Civil War, the, the people had, had huge resistance to fascism, but because they had, some were social democrat leaders, some were Soviet communist leaders who believed that um, the Soviet Union shouldn't be threatened by, the, by, the, uh, by too much trouble in, in Spain, and that, that uh, Turmoil in Spain would threaten the, the, the existence of the Soviet Union. So that was led into a, another, down another cul-de-sac. Um, so constantly, it's a question of leadership. And that, that's the question that's always fascinated us. But, but it's, it's as contemporary as it can be, because it's the issue now. You know, faced with the austerity and the cuts, and the mass unemployment and the collapse of neoliberalism, huge resistance. How do we lead it? You know, and we're still fragmented country by country when we, what we need is a European wide movement of resistance with a clear political program, united action, country to country. Easy to say what we need, but, but we don't have it. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, like you, I, I hate the mechanical um, Images of the working class on the moon with a fist in the air, you know, I, I hate that. It, it's inhuman, it has no, it doesn't touch us, uh, it's a mechanical, um, mechanical kind of art form which I absolutely reject. Um, and the, the political is always human and it's, it's as varied and as contradictory as people are. 
Um, the political tradition that I, I came through when I was young was the opposite of Stalinism. It was socialist but anti-Stalinist. Um, and we have always been very hostile to that um, uh, glorified, that sort of false glorification. So I, I agree with you that the test always has to be, does it, is it true in human terms as well as is it true in political terms? Um, the, the, the question about family life, yeah. Um, I mean, for family life be, um, was the, um, the original idea came from the producer, Tony Garnett, that I talked about earlier. And um, it was based on the work of a, a, an, an, an analyst called R.D. Lang. Um, and uh, it's since been, was very hotly disputed. Um, I mean, put crudely, his thesis was that um, and this is too crude, but to put it very simply, that, that madness was, uh, was a response to an in, intolerable family circumstances. And uh, it's more subtle than that, but in one line. Um, and he had did a, a work, very famous book called Sanity, Madness and the Family, and took case histories of particularly young, young people who had suffered, he was very precise, suffered from the diagnosis of schizophrenia, and um, this was an amalgam. Family life was an amalgam of several of these cases, um, and uh, I think it. I think it. It was a useful position to take, but I think. I think it's. It's now been modified, um, but there were truths within the family, which um, I hope the film dealt with as, as well as the, the the medical side, which I think you know probably we would question now. To some extent, um, but it, it was a very important film for us, really. But when it was shown in, in Britain, it uh, it failed abjectly at the box office, and the the distributor, who was more used to doing kind of um, comedies of a sexual nature, um, <laughs> said that it didn't take enough money to pay the usherettes. So uh, that's a measure of how, how disastrous it was at the box office. Um, but it was it was an it was a I, I don't regret. I mean, it was a good film to do, even though we didn't do it particularly well. Um, and then you've got a question which is sparked off by Dan Day Lewis. Yes, in, uh, I, I haven't seen Daniel Day Lewis um, play Lincoln. Um, I don't know who won. Um, um, whether, I think he did. Uh, did. Daniel Day Lewis three, Lincoln nil. I think was the last one. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know. I mean, he's. Um, I, I, I met him. He's a, a very, I met him and they found him a very nice guy. And uh, I, haven't, I haven't seen the performance, so I can't say. But I think in general, I think you could, you can imitate an accent. Um, how people spoke in the 19th century, goodness knows. So anything that is that far back in history is a, is a kind of, it's a guess at how people spoke. Um, and it becomes very theatrical, I think. Inevitably, it becomes theatrical and um, becomes quite operatic, I would think. Uh, but I, I, you know, great respect for Daniel Day Lewis, and as I say, I, I met him as a very nice guy. I think what's always interested me and the writers and, and the producer I work with is that, um, is, is to find the microcosm to find the detail that describes a much bigger picture. So a, a lot of what we've done have been quite domestic, but you try and find a little story that, if you just tell that story well and accurately, then you reveal something about the whole society. Um, so it, it, doesn't, it doesn't start out as, a, as an epic, but it's, it's a small, just a small little detail. Like in Raining Stones, it's simply about a guy who is unemployed. He has a daughter who is uh, seven, and she's going to have her first communion, a Catholic family, have her first communion. And everybody in the neighborhood, when she has, they have their first communion, they have a new dress. And he hasn't got the money for a dress. So how does he get it? And it's his efforts to get the money, his efforts to retain his dignity. Um, and then the borrowing of the money from a loan shark and the consequences of his borrowing the money for the family um, that is the story. 
But, you know, a little girl needs a dress for communion. It's a tiny, tiny thing. But you hope that in telling that story, it says something about, about the loss of dignity for the people who are employees. And the bigger question, why, why are people without work? Um, so we, we tried that, but then sometimes um, there are big, big stories that, that determine the way we've all developed, determine the way um, the world has changed. And those stories, you, you know, really demand to be told. Um, so, for example, the, the struggle for leadership of the Republicans in the Spanish Civil War was, was something that the writer Jim Allen and I talked about for a long time. And um, finally we managed to, to tell it. Um, again, with a very low budget. I mean, we didn't, we didn't have many soldiers. It was a, you know, two trucks, I think, for the whole war, um, which was not really adequate. But um, it was an amazing film to, to make, really. Um, and, and that scene was an amazing day, day and a half. Um, and we, we had a we had a mixture. We had um, we had the, the, the militia who, the, 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 who were fighting, and they were they were a mission. There was people there, uh, one or two actors, some uh, some young Spanish people, some with an anarchist background, um, some with a socialist background. Um, the, the guy who spoke passionately at the end was a was a car mechanic. Um, the uh, the American who spoke is actually at the Berlin Festival this this week. Actually, he's, he's here. I was with him. Tom Tom Gilroy, great great guy. Um, he's got a film here, um, and uh, he was an American actor. Uh, clearly, the, the the German who spoke was working in Spain, uh, not an actor, uh, but interested in politics. Um, the the older the, the, the guy who who uh, looked triumphant when the Americans spoke he, he was a, he was an actor uh, but um, politically engaged um, there were a lot of the earlier part of the scene was was mainly from trade unionists who lived nearby um, and there was one old guy who, who came along who was extraordinary um, we, we we were doing the film in this small small town and. Um, some of the trade unionists who were, who were in the scene and who, who adopted different positions but were very passionate about what had happened and still the passion still they still the passion still burned in them and they said before we shot they said there's, a, there's an old guy come back to the village who, who fought in the war and who had to leave and, and live in France under Franco but he's just started coming back to see some of his family that he, you know, descendants that he hasn't seen before. Can he be in the film? So we said, yeah, of course, bring him along. But, um, and he was a passionate Republican, um, socialist, um, hadn't lived in Spain under Franco at all, hadn't been able to come back. And we, we said we we're making this film and he came along and, and we sat around the table and people found their places. And um, the guy who was to, to chair it, to like to do your job, uh, was an actor, but, and, but also a socialist. And, and he, um, he was going to just keep it in order. I didn't direct it, he kept it in order. I, I said who was to speak, but he, he, he handled it and I directed it through him. And when we started to shoot, this guy, Jordi Dardo, a lovely man, um, I said that I just gave him a sign and you know he started and we were turning and he said um, okay the, the meeting's coming to order uh, and what we're going to talk about is the collectivization of the land in this village now that the landlord is no longer here and this old guy was listening and he put his hand up and he said uh, excuse me he said excuse me before we go any further he said uh, who, who elected you <laughs> <laughs> I said, look, I'm terribly sorry, but it is a film, you know, we're doing a film. And, uh, I, I've asked him to run the meeting. He said, no, 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 we don't do things like that. He said, you, you have to be elected. So, um, 
we, one of the uh, one of the guys in the meeting uh, said, mm -hmm. "Okay, he said I, I propose that Jordy Dowlett is the chairman for this meeting." <laughs> and, uh, someone else, a woman, said that yes, I, I second that proposal. Um, all in favour? They all put their hands up, and the guy said, "Yes, okay." <laughs> and then, 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 then later on, um, he put up his hand to speak, and. Uh, we didn't know what he was going to say at all. <laughs> and he said, uh, he said, I have to say something. He said, he said, the revolution is like a pregnant cow. <laughs> if you don't give birth to the calf, when the calf is ready to be born, the cow will die. We need the revolution now. <laughs> and uh, it, it touched everybody. And um, I, I have to... I, I was very, uh, very moving. I'd say. It, if, if there's simply going to be, if there's no scripted lines, probably not. Um, if they've got a lot to say, then however long it takes them to absorb it. Um, so it, it, it depends. If I mean, for for some people, maybe half the script, because it's all about revealing the early part of the film. Maybe it's all about revealing their past. So for that, yes, I give them a lot. If if they if it, the script doesn't reveal anything, then maybe just two or three scenes. So the the, the central criterion is is the director's job to make the actor as good as they can possibly be. If if, if the actor is not as good as they absolutely the very best they can be, it's the director's fault. It's not the act, never the actor's fault. Because the, the actors all, will always have ability. They will always have qualities. And it's the director's job to, to bring them out, to polish them, to present them, to make them absolutely the very best they can be. To film them in the most sympathetic light. To give them moves that, that come from the guts of the actor, not from some elaborate conceit of the director. You know, so like little directions like, you know, flick your ash at this point, I would never give because what's the point? The, the, the instinct must come from the actual orbit. Um, so it's, all, it's a pragmatic question when you give the script. You just have to work out when's the, when's the moment that they need to see this in order to do it well, but not, but not to be too... Um, to be too familiar with it, that it's become boring, or not boring, but, but uh, taken for granted. And sometimes when there's a scene, when somebody has to make a, like a long, say a lot of things, then it's important that the other people in the scene really <coughs> listen. So I wouldn't give the long speech to the other people in the scene, because what you want is their attention. And you get their attention when, by really listening. And if they've been reading it for six weeks, you know, they're not going to pay attention so well. And, and the critical thing, suppose someone has to break down, you know, you want them to break down. You, you never say to an actor, look, I want you to cry at this point. Because it would be terrifying to go, oh, God, I'm, I'm not going to manage it. So you have to manipulate the scene in such a way that that's, that's what they will do, you know. So they, it's always directing, like, through other people. Um, I have the impression also that you create a very special working environment for actors because uh, the, the situation being an actor in a film can be extraordinarily kind of technical and harsh. And talking to I personally work with Barry Aykroyd, but you know, the, the whole the whole I remember Barry Aykroyd saying, you know, who is who is who is a, has been a crucial part of this team, saying to cinematographers, look, it's fine, we can talk about lenses a lot and stuff if you like, but the fact is you're st you're the one standing right next to the actress when she's naked and having a breakdown, and if you're not useful in that space because we're thinking about lenses, then we're certainly not a cinematographer. So that so that so that everything about making that performance, I have the impression, in your space uh, is all contained and organised for that. Yes, yes, absolutely. So it, it's quite a private thing, I think, filmmaking. Um, you know, unless it's a big public event, you know, but, but the scene you're filming, but it's quite a private thing. So, you know, we, we have no monitors ever. You know, nobody's standing around having a judgment about what's going on. It's really private. Um, maybe something like the size of a postage stamp on the side of the camera for the, for the focus puller, so that he can see where the camera's. Um, framing. 
but uh, nothing else. No, no, nobody sees it, and nobody in the in the room watching. You know, nobody outside. Um, just the boom swinger, and maybe the the the, the continuity and the camera and the focus pull, and, and that's oh. it. Or sometimes not even me, actually, I see that side and listen. <laughs> as, as the man said, the task is not only to interpret the world, but to change it to so, um, There's a good precedent for um, trying to change the, change the world. Um, I, I think it's, it's a bit like um, judges and the law. The judges interpret the law, but at the same time, by interpreting it, they try to modify it. Um, I mean, I don't think we can have such grand ambition. Um, we are, um, you make a film, you're one small voice in a great cacophony of voices from the press, from the politicians, from the media, um, from the huge public discourse. You make a film, you're one small voice. And it, we shouldn't exaggerate the effect we can have. But it would, it's nice to leave people with a question, it's nice to leave people with a, a challenge, with a, some energy when they leave the cinema to pursue some ideas that they may already have. Um, I think that's the most we can aim for really, is to, is to support those who we would want to support. Um, and uh, maybe to touch people that wouldn't be touched otherwise. Um, to tell them a story they wouldn't know otherwise. Um, and then when the cinema empties, then it's up to them, you know. Um, the, um, then you're on to Eric. Eric Cantona, great man. Um, <laughs> I was much in awe of Eric Cantona, and, uh, um, and it was a delight to work with him. And he, he's, he, he's a good actor, he acts um, as he plays football with great panache, and uh, great style, and great charisma, and... Um, um, he was a great guy, and uh, um, I did a lot of I could say about Eric, but he was a, he was a good actor, and he worked. He just became part of the team, you know. As they say in my country, there's no I in the word team. Um, mm -hmm. You don't spell team with an I. There's no individual in the team, and uh, mm -hmm. he was a good team player. Uh, Eric. Um, um, then, then, then keeping the faith in the fa fact that there will be audiences and that the two people in the back of the stalls. Yes. Well, um, um, I, I'm sorry if there was no one there when you went. So, some people did go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, enough people went to, um, to pay back the people that invested in the film and they made a little bit extra so we can carry on working. And uh, it has had quite a life um, after, it was, after it was made and, you know, in other media and still comes into the cinemas from time to time. So uh, um, I'm sorry you went on a bad night. Maybe the next night wasn't too bad. Um, and, um, and then keep, 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 keep keeping performances fresh in many takes. Yes. Um, now that's um, that's a good question. You know, how do you keep the performance fresh? The the, the main thing is shoot the reaction first. Maybe break the usual mold and shoot the close up first. Whenever the person is going to be at their best, that's when you've got to be on them on the right lens. And sometimes you judge it wrong. You know, sometimes you judge it wrong. Sometimes you think you'll need one shot for the actor to get to get um, to get to the point of the, the emotional point you want to get. So maybe you'll do a like a a looser shot that will start to generate the emotion in the scene. And then you have to cut that shot short. Don't film the whole scene. Go to another angle. Take this. Take the shot where the the actors are at their peak, and then go back and redo the looser shot or the other shot um, to get the rest of the scene. Um, it, you'd have to judge it moment by moment. Um, as for shock, then again you've got to you've got to shoot the one the angle that you want to use for that shot. Sometimes it's all in one shot. Sometimes it isn't. Sometimes you know. Sometimes you can do it in one shot. Um, so uh, and it's very pragmatic, I think. But it, it, that's it's judging. It's like boiling boiling kettles on a on a on a on a on a stove. You know, boiling. You, you, you've got to keep them all simmering, and it's, you just have to judge it. You know.
moment by moment. But you have a storyboard, you know your shots, you know the shots you want to have. I, I didn't have a storyboard, no. I have a couple of squiggles that no one else sees. Um, because I think you have to be adaptable. The trouble, I would never give a storyboard to the, to the cameraman or the, the sound recorders because then they say, okay, we've done this one now, now where are we going to do this one? And they start preparing it and you don't want it prepared. So we just prepare the room and light the room, not light the shot, just light the room or the space so that you can move from end to end very simply. Um, if, if you light it shot by shot, you're screwed. <laughs> because, because by the time you've de-rigged the one shot, they've gone dead, you know, you've lost it. It's, it's like a bubble, really, you've got to keep the line. The idea of the angel chair. The angel chair came um, from a conversation with Paul Laverty, the writer. Uh, we wanted to do something about the huge, the millions of people across Europe, kids without work, with no future, can't plan their lives can't get a house, can't have a family with any security because they have no work, are constantly ripped off. Um, a great betrayal of a generation, really, two generations, that should make us very angry and make us really say well, this is intolerable. And we thought the, the obvious film to make is, um, you know, it's a tragedy, because it is a tragedy, but we thought maybe we can we can retain people's sense of the wrongness of that, but try and also capture the young people's energy and fun and wit and comedy. Um, and Paul uh, Laverty had the idea of um, of uh, introducing whiskey into this because whiskey is is Scotland's national drink. <laughs> But most of the kids don't drink it because it's too expensive. You know, they can get drunk quicker on cheaper booze. So, um, and whiskey is very pretentious. You know, it costs a huge amount of money for a very rare whiskey. Um, and yet making it is a great skill, a great craft. So he thought if he could introduce a, a story of the, these unemployed kids with nothing, um, being involved in this world this mis of mystique and maybe a crime which has no victims but which sets them on a different path. We could tell a little comedy but also keep the, the sense of anger about what we're doing collectively to this generation. Um, so that's where it came from and uh, the, 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 the storyline is Paul's. It, it, Paul I think it's the same. But um, don't overwork them. Um, only um, make the shots very simple. You know, the camera set up very simple so that you can cope with whatever they do and get a nice shot. So you just put the camera in the corner of the room, put on a nice lens, give them the space. Um, what age are the children you're going to work with? Is this, is this one of the cast no, there? Four, four to, no, no, she's too young. <laughs> four to twelve. Three, three children. Two boys, they are twelve, eight, and four. Yes. Yeah. Um, well, they, they, they will get tired, you know, so, so allow for them to get tired. Don't overwork them. Um, keep them, don't spoil them. Key thing, don't spoil them. I mean, sometimes film crews, you know, they ply them with sweets or they give them too much chocolate. It's fatal. <laughs> um, and, um, and, and don't, don't be that intimate that you're, you know, you, there has to be a certain distance so that when they're working for you the, as the director, they're still on their best behaviour. You know, if, if you're like their mother or their father, it's too intimate and then, and they don't, they don't get the energy to perform for you. So I, I found you, you have to be obviously very good friends, but you, you're not like their mother or their father. You, there has to be that slight distance. Um, and, uh, and just very simple shots, very simple lighting, so they don't notice the lighting. And they just come in and they respond to what's in front of them in a, in a natural way. And, and don't work for long hours. And for the text, how, how do they... Uh. 
It's um, fantastic to watch this surgery going on, but I'm going to have to do the session. So you have to take it out there, and it's probably, uh, pro probably, probably a better way. In case in one line. Uh, okay, yeah. on the text, just... <laughs> If it's the 12 year old, he, he might be able to learn to have some lines beforehand. But the 4 year old, the 5 year old, just give them the line before they do the shot. I would. But it's trial and error, you know, you'll soon see. Okay. Well, I, I just, I just, I just uh, you know, I'm very, I, I'm, I'm very struck by something I just want to point at, which is that we've had, you know, an hour and three quarters of, of discussion or more. And, you know, rather than having a discussion about sort of abstract political engagement or the notion of engaged cinema or all kinds of things which are um, in, in a way theoretical, we're really talking about uh, the people who are in this history that we're trying to reclaim and, uh, and performance and, and the reality of, of filmmaking from moment to moment. And I think that's an extraordinary way of properly understanding um, what, uh, what you've taught these people here through an entire career and now through a couple of hours of more talk. And so on their behalf, uh, I'd like to thank you very much indeed. Thank you.